Hi, my name is Brian and today I'm going to be shooting a series of shots to talk about an aquarium stand that I'm building. I have a eight foot long by three foot wide by two foot deep acrylic aquarium that I built a few years ago. And I'm in the process of remodeling this house that I purchased about half, yeah, about six months ago. And I've decided this time that I'm gonna build the aquarium stand out of steel. And so these uh, series of shots that I'm going to do today and over the next week or so and put together into a video chronicle what goes into building a steel aquarium stand. So uh, I'm using four inch uh, square steel. It is, uh, I believe it's 11 gauge. Um, I'll, I'll check that later when I get ready to weld. And uh, the reason I'm building this out of steel is that the last one was made out of wood and it was okay. But the reality is, is that Saltwater aquariums leak, you know, not always, not intentionally, but you just, you spill water and wood does not like to get wet. Um, it tends to degrade it and it tends to cause processes to take place. And so it's just better if you build the stand out of something that um, it doesn't matter if it gets wet. Um, the other advantage that steel has is it's very, very strong and very lightweight. I do not have the luxury of being able to have a fish room 20 feet away and connect my fish room and my aquarium and have all my pumps and stuff out in the fish room. So I need more space under my aquarium. And building the stand out of steel gives me that space because I can use smaller material. Um, to build this out of uh, lumber would require two by six or two by eight material. And um, that just takes up a lot of space. So this will give me a little bit more space and it will be a lot stronger um, and I'm using a uh, Harbor Freight 93762 uh, vertical or horizontal bandsaw. Um, you know, it's really a horizontal bandsaw. I suppose you could lock it in this position, but quite frankly, I've thrown away the pieces for that. So I, I use it as a horizontal bandsaw. Um, I normally cut wet with transmission fluid as a lubricant, but I'm actually cutting dry this time and I'm doing it inside because I don't want, um, I don't want rust all over my patio outside and I can clean this up easier. So I'm going to walk back and just show you the setup. You can see that I have a empty box here to catch um, cuttings and then I'm using a couple of uh, boxes to um, support the material as it drops off the saw and this just prevents it from you know um, bad things from happening so this will drop down and it'll just sit there and it'll it'll cushion the fall as this cuts through now when it comes time to weld let me pan over here I've got a Millermatic 211A or 211 and this is a auto setting MIG welder um, it's you know basically you dial in the thickness of the material and the size of wire you're using and it, it sets itself um, that's the marketing in reality you tend to adjust it just a little bit one way or the other to um, get a good bead I also have a uh, and I, I apologize, let me go back. I run this as a gas process, so that's what the bottle of gas behind it. Gives me a clean, good weld. I also have a flux core welder on this cart that I built, and I also have a plasma cutter over here. And plasma cutting has its, has its strengths and it has its weaknesses. It's not particularly good at making precise cuts. And to get a good weld, you need precise cuts. Um, the better the pieces fit together, the um, better the, uh, the assembly is because the welding is more precise and you don't have to fill as much material. And hopefully my autofocus will behave today. It did not behave in the last series of videos that I shot. So I have the saw stopped for this video. I'm gonna go ahead and start it and you'll hear that it is just a little bit on the loud side. And I always run the saw on the slowest speed when I'm dry cutting. Um, it tends to make the blade last longer and um, I'm not really in a hurry, especially not with the saw. And this is a Starette series blade that can be ordered on Amazon.com. And I found that the, the Starette blades are more expensive, but they're really worth it in the end. 
So uh, again, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy my video. Okay, so the cut has finished and it's always important to stay near the machine while you're cutting. Um, it's it happens sometimes that the material will fall in such a way as to fall against the blade and then it will jam the machine and that um, added stress often will break the bandsaw and that's about a $30 penalty. So you always want to stay by and the instant it stops, uh, finishes the cut, you either want to shut the machine off or it will auto sh shut itself off. In this particular case, it has fallen towards the arm and um, it's in a stable position so I went ahead and just manually hit the off switch. And so this is one of the uh, long pieces of the stand and um, I'm going to go ahead and set up for the second piece and I'll let you see how I do that setup. Now, the yard that I buy from in Houston is called Triple S Steel. And they do, these pieces come in 20 foot lengths. And that's a little too long for me to handle, especially by myself like I'm working today. So what I typically do is I look at the ends and one of the ends is a factory end, which this one is because it's painted red. And the other is what I call the courtesy cut that the yard did, and it's down here. The courtesy cut is almost never straight. The mill cut is often better than what I can do with my machine. And so, in this case, I'm cutting pieces that are 97 inches long. I want it to stick out one inch past the end of the aquarium where the, um, the sump is, or the overflow box is. And, um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip this around and I'm gonna keep the factory cut because I think it's better than what I could do. A Little bit space constrained in here. And this is a little bit on the heavy side. So one of the things I do is I wear gloves because um, the pieces of steel have a lot of oil on them. The oil protects the steel from moisture and prevents rust while it's sitting at the, at the steel yard. So um, there are a couple of different ways to line up the piece of steel to cut it. And what I'm doing is the quick, easy, and lazy way. I use a tape measure that has easy to rate, read gradation on it, or marks if you want to call them that. And what I've done is I've just kind of lined this up by sight and I'm going to lower the blade down and then I'm just going to read against the blade and um, scoot the material over until it lines up. And it helps to shake the material Again, I'm dealing with probably 60, 65 pounds of steel here, so it, if I shake the steel, it will slide a very small amount um, very easily. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and lock it down. And um, one of the things I didn't talk about is how much steel I bought. And um, it doesn't all have to be this size, but it is simpler for me as a fabricator, especially an amateur fabricator, to buy all my steel the same size. And I could have bought smaller pieces of steel that were thicker, because it's actually the, the shape plays a certain amount of uh, a factor in the engineering, but the, um, it's the, the quantity of steel that actually does the work. Um, and, um, but I happen to like the four inch size. It looks very beefy and solid and industrial. And that's an aspect of the design that I thought was desirable. Um, I've used this size of steel in the past. In fact, my welding cart, which is sitting right over there, is made out of this exact steel. I think it's a little bit thinner steel, 
but it's made out of the exact same steel. I welded it together. Um, I did use smaller pieces for the cord wraps and then I painted the thing with, with Rust-Oleum paint. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start the cut. And I always lower it gently onto the piece. If you were to drop it, you would shock the blade. And again, anytime you shock or stress the blade, you increase the odds of breaking it. It almost always breaks where it is welded together because it's one long piece of steel that's then brought back into a loop and then it's welded um, probably with a spot weld process and then they, they sand that down and finish it so it's smooth. But anytime you stress that, that blade, you run the risk of breaking it and breaking blades is expensive, so I try not to do it. Okay, so um, while I'm cutting, I'm actually starting to cut the pieces that run from the front to the back. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the design characteristics and the things that you need to be thinking of when you design a aquarium stand. So one of the concepts is called modulus of elasticity and it essentially is how much will the uh, structure flex. So if my hands are the beam and I were to put them together and say that this forms a beam, where they touch in the middle I could put a load and how much that would cause my hands to flex would be modules of elasticity. And I think there's a small disclaimer that's due here. I'm not an engineer. I do play one on YouTube, but I'm still not an engineer. Um, I have taken some very basic classes taught by a licensed professional engineer through my local makerspace. That still doesn't make me an engineer. And so if you have any doubts about your own capabilities or the risks involved in your project, you should really seek out the advice of someone who's qualified to give it. Um, I'm just sharing what works for me and why I do what I do. So uh, there's some calculators on the internet that you can say I'm using four inch 11 gauge square steel tubing and my span is this long and I'm gonna put this amount of weight in the center of it and it'll tell you your span will flex X, X amount. So the first thing you have to do is figure out, well, what's your aquarium way? And I wrote a piece of software a few years ago called Aquarium Pocket Knife. It's freeware, it's, it's available on the internet to download. And you put in the dimensions of your aquarium and it will tell you what it weighs. And in my particular case, it weighs 3,000 pounds. And so I assume that two thirds of the weight of my aquarium could be on one portion of it, worst case at any given time. And that means that my aquarium stand is way over engineered. And that's a good thing because I don't want it to fall over, ever. And uh, so I divide it into two halves and two sides. And each corner of the aquarium is capable of supporting 2,000 pounds while only deflecting five one hundredths of an inch. That's not a lot of deflection and it's way overbuilt. So I have an aquarium stand that could probably, it would probably collapse at around six tons and it's supporting one and a half. Um, that's a good margin of error. I don't have to worry about the compressive strength of the steel because I know it can handle it. Um, and by the way, the steel has a compressive strength of something like 110,000 pounds per square inch. Um, and I think it has an elastic strength of something like 28,000 pounds per square inch. So, you know, steel can handle the load and that's part of the reason I'm using it. And so as I cut the pieces, I'll take them outside and stage them and then I'll start welding them together. Um, I'm well, doing some of the welding outside at, and I'll bring the assemblies in and assemble them. Um, at best, this will be an all-day process. At worst, this will take a few weeks. 